discern the desperate nature of the spiritual warfare for their souls, I believe they would be shaken to their bootlaces. Still, God's word commands us to resist sin because we have the power to do so and the power to gain the victory. No one else has. We are to resist it as it strives against us for ascendancy and it will strive. Verse 13 explains explicitly how the strategy of sin can be defeated. Let's read it together please. Back in Romans chapter 6 verse 13. <clears throat> Let's read aloud please. Ready? Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin. But yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. It's really just a question of who you yield to. The old master or the new master. At this point, you're faced with Two commands, two imperatives in the Greek. The first is, neither yield your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin. You are commanded not to yield to the old master. You know that he is going to come and he is going to demand obedience from you just the way he always has. But you are commanded to gloriously defy him. Just like David defied Goliath. When you read that story, doesn't it just raise something within you that wants to say, David, champion. Well, it wasn't David that was the champion. It was David's God that was the champion. And that's what we're supposed to have. You know, when Goliath came out against David, he ranted and he railed at David. Threatened to tear him apart and feed him to the birds. Just a boy, 16, maybe 15. And all these seasoned soldiers were shaken in their boots. But like David, you can stand on the promises of God to win the day. You really can. I'm sure there are those of you here who have besetting sins. I'm sure there are. You don't have to be dominated by sin. Plant your feet firmly on those foundation stones. Meditate on these things. Reckon on it. Recite it. Let it be your battle cry. When the temptation comes, right at the point of temptation, you have to know this stuff. And you have to say, this is, this, we're not talking about psychological games, we're talking about things that God has done. So that you might stand in the battle, folks. I'm not playing psychological games here. God doesn't do that. This is the only way you can have victory. There is no other way. But God's way. You need to say, I am crucified with Christ and in Him I have died to the old master. That's a summary, but you need to go right into these things and as I said before, let them affect you deeply and change you and that's the way you'll get the power to win. You find then that you will have the courage to stand right up in the face of the tyrant when he comes to you and just say, no, I don't need to yield to you anymore. <coughs> but David was really only one man out of a whole army. Could the others have stood up and defied Goliath just as easily? Of course they could. But they were conditioned by the belief that he was invincible. What about you? You think about that sin that you know is wrong. 
You've laid down your arms. You believe it really is invincible. What about God? Is He not the one who is invincible? Is He not your champion? Because that's what it comes down to. It comes down in the end ultimately to a question of belief, just as it did in the days of David and the armies of Israel. Who believes wins? You either believe what the Bible says or you listen to your feelings and your old fears and they become the thing which awe you and captivate your mind. You're going to be awed by one thing or the other. Either by the glorious power of God's victory or by the fear of failure again, again, again. That's really what sorts the men out from the boys on the spiritual battlefield. And that is why it's so important to spend time in God's Word, just like David did, knowing and reckoning on these great truths. Because faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. Now the second command that we're given here in verse 13 is this. But yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead. A little reminder there, saying that we are in union with the living one. And your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. It is true that God has transferred you from the old realm into a new realm where you have access to a power that guarantees victory. But it would be very foolish indeed to think that that victory will automatically fall into your lap effortlessly. Surprisingly, the Greek word for yield does not imply passivity at all like it would seem to in our English language. Just yield, oh, just, you know. No, it doesn't mean that. <clears throat> to the contrary, it teaches that we are to actively present ourselves to God for duty. as soldiers presenting themselves to their superior, ready to receive orders. We, as believers, must continually do everything that we can to place ourselves at the disposal of the Master. The next message I preach will be the last one in the series of Romans is entitled, Slaves of Righteousness, because that's literally what the Bible teaches. That is what he will be saying in the next few verses. We won't go there tonight. But we are to put ourselves at the disposal of the Master. To make ourselves or put ourselves in a position where we are able to serve him mentally and physically. And to do so as perfectly as we can. Because we have the power to do that. Because we are under grace, and grace infuses the power to do that. Under the law, you did not have the power to do that. But you do under grace. A whole new understanding of grace, which is not emphasised in all the grace books you can buy from Kurong. Practically, this translates into such things as possibly preparing yourself for future ministry through appropriate training. It can translate into simple things like doing your daily devotions, attending all of the church services, letting it be known when you're in church that you are willing to serve in the church. And these are just a few ways of presenting yourself to God for service, practical ways. It has to translate into concrete obedience at some point. Otherwise it's all theory. A lot of people are kidding themselves by saying I'm God's servant. And you can see full well there's no long-term dedication or discipline to anything. That kind of thing takes...
takes character and commitment to do it when you don't want to do it. You are doulos, a slave of righteousness. There are times when I don't want to go to church. But it's not up to me what I want to do. I'm not my own man. Neither are you. This word, presenting yourself to God for service, is you standing to attention and saluting and saying, Yes, sir. Anything you say, sir. That's what it means. Present. It is actually translated present. It can be translated that way. Have you ever considered, really, that such a simple, practical strategy may be at least part of the answer to your struggle with sin? It may be that you are not yielding to righteousness and pre presenting yourself to God for service. According to this verse, it is. You remember David got himself in trouble spiritually when he neglected his duty practically on the battlefield? God only commands believers to yield, to present themselves in this way to service. He does not require this kind of thing of unsaved people. They are still legally under the dominion of sin. They can't resist sin's reign over them even if they wanted to. And if they did manage to get a little victory over sin, and some unsaved people can give up smoking, they can even do some other things that perhaps Christians struggle with. But if they do, it's only going to be replaced by a more subtle and more deep-seated sin, like pride, which is only going to separate them even further from the opportunity to yield to God. Why, well, I can do this myself. I don't need God. It's only to the believer that God issues this command. For only the believer is equipped for the struggle. And more than that, he's the only one who's equipped to gain victory. I want us to read verse 14. We'll read this one aloud together. Last verse that we're looking at for this evening. Ready? For sin shall not have dominion over you. For ye are not under the law, but under grace. Let's just look at that first phrase, sin shall not have dominion over you. This is a glorious statement and it's given to us as an encouragement. Declaring that our victory is a sure victory. If we resist the power of sin, if we refuse to yield to it as its servants, and if we consciously present ourselves to God for service. Of course we have to do these things. But it's built upon God's work. God has undone the powers. We can have victory over them. We've all only got to go forward, engage them in battle. So this is very good news for you who suffer from besetting sins and bondage to addictions. It means that you can escape and be free from those things. Oh yes, you can expect a battle. But the outcome of that battle has been decided. If you're going to yield to the new master, if you present yourself to him ready to serve. I want us to reread verse 14 again. Now, I'll just let you follow me this time silently so you can concentrate. For sin shall not have dominion over you. For, or for this reason, the reason that sin shall not have dominion over you is given as the, what follows in the next phrase. Ye are not under the law, but under grace. It's given as a reason or a ground for the statement.